Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jason Embry, and I am a uh, board member here at the LBJ Future Forum, and want to thank all of you uh, for joining us here for our conversation, The Aftermath, discussing the midterms. Uh, the Future Forum is an organization that brings together individuals with different backgrounds, experiences, and points of view to discuss local, statewide, and national topics that affect us today. Our goal is to create civil, informed, and bipartisan discussions, which is needed now more than ever. The Future Forum's events are made possible by our incredible members and sponsors, including Texas Monthly, Carbock Brewing, Austin Wine Merchant, and Joe Cook's Catering. If you are not a member, I strongly encourage you to sign up before you leave. We've also left information on your tables. Upcoming events will cover Austin Housing, the legislative session, which will start in January, and Women in Leadership. I'm very excited to begin today's discussion focusing on the recent elections and the political trends that we're seeing. Please keep in mind there will be time for questions at the end of the panel. And I uh, want to also, on behalf of the Future Forum Board, uh, give a special thanks to our panel, um, especially our uh, elected officials who uh, took time out of, the, out of uh, their very busy schedules to be here. Um, I think we have um, uh, on stage two of the uh, really smartest, uh, uh, most energetic uh, young leaders in the, in the legislature who I think are going to provide a lot of uh, insight, and I'm very glad to have not only them, but all of our, our experts who are here today who are going to lead us through this discussion. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Karina Kling, uh, our, our anchor for Capital uh, Tonight from Spe Spectrum News, to introduce our guests and moderate the discussion. Thank you, Jason. I know there were some jokes going around about whether or not the smartest, and the <laughs> I guess we'll find out. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for having us. I just wanted to go ahead and introduce the panel. Next to me is Alexa Udra. She's a reporter for the Texas Tribune, where she covers demographics, voting rights, and politics with a focus on the state's growing Hispanic population. Next to her is Representative Eric Johnson. He's a Dallas Democrat who's represented the people of District 100 since 2010. You nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> He's vice chair of the redistricting committee, serves on Ways and Means, and was a Democratic candidate for Texas House Speaker. More on that in a little bit. And Representative Jeff Leach is a Republican from Plano and has represented the people of District 67 since 2013. He serves as vice chair of the Urban Affairs Committee and describes himself as a constitutional conservative. And Jim Henson probably needs no introduction in this crowd, but is the director of the Texas Politics Project here at the University of Texas. He founded and co-directs the UT Texas Tribune poll and is a lecturer in the government department and a regular go-to for news media on Texas politics, government, everything else. You see him on our program a lot. So again, please welcome all of the panelists. <laughs> So as said, this uh, discussion is called The Aftermath, discussing the 2018 midterms. So I thought, what better way to start with some uh, post-election tweets? <laughs> and uh, these come from two of our panelists, Representative Leach. You tweeted shortly after the election, Texas Republicans, we indeed got a wake-up call this week, and we have two choices. We can push snooze and go back to sleep, or we can wake up, put our feet on the floor, and work diligently to address the issues that matter most to Texans. I choose the latter. Hashtag refuse to snooze. I like that. I like that. I did make that up. I promise. I did. You made that up? The, the, the refuse hashtag? to snooze. Like yes, it. that's the first hashtag that I've actually Maybe created. Maybe don't trend. <laughs> no. Representative Johnson, you wrote, woke this morning to the reality that hashtag Texas, hashtag Democrats gained 12 seats in the Texas House, largely due to a Covey bust in Dallas, which changed the Dallas County House delegation that I chair from seven Texas Democrats and seven Texas GOP in 2017 to 12 Ds and two Rs in 2019. So I think it's probably fair to say you can both agree that Democrats had a pretty good night on November 6th. Uh, what was the driving factor? Representative Johnson, I'll start with you. Do you think this was strictly Beto mania, Trump backlash, or do you think that there is a changing tide here in Texas? I think the first thing we can agree on is that uh, Representative Leach is more succinct than I am in his tweets, that's for <laughs> sure. Uh, you had the better hashtag for sure. Um, well. I think you know, there are a couple of things, very few things that happen in politics like anything else, any other natural phenomena are just you know, univariate in terms of what caused it. I mean, there, there's probably several things going on, but certainly um, having a very charismatic 
um, very hardworking, I would say, you know, maybe once in a generation type of candidate in Beto O'Rourke at the top of the ticket certainly played a factor, I mean, played a role, and it was a, a major factor in energizing parts of the Democratic base that I believe have been in Texas for a long time, but have not necessarily believed um, that we could win and have um, hit that proverbial snooze button a long time ago and have been asleep. They, they, they existed, but they were asleep, and I think um, Beto helped wake them up. And so that had down ballot effects, I think, um, you saw in the, in the Texas legislature in particular. And in Dallas, that was the epicenter of where I think you saw this activity. Beto spent a considerable amount of time in the Dallas area. At one point, I actually joked with some of my friends that I'm not sure if he's moved from El Paso to Dallas, if he lives here or what, because he's, he was having more events in Dallas and was there more than I was some weeks. So I, I really was uh, impressed with the campaign he put together, and it, and it showed, and, it, the res, and what it showed in, the result of it was, um, what I call that Covey bus was, we went from a delegation that had seven Republicans and seven Democrats in Dallas County to one that has 12 Democrats and only two Republicans. One of those two Republicans actually is only ahead, the, the race is it go, headed to a recount, because he only won by 200 votes or so. So um, it, it's pretty extraordinary. And I, so I'm gonna say Beto was the primary factor, but there were others. Yeah, I mean, Representative Leach, what's your take on that? But also, I mean, as he's saying, woke up a lot of Democrats. Do they, are Republicans concerned that they, you know, to coin a phrase, stay woke? <laughs> Well, look, it, it was a wake-up call. Um, I use that term uh, because that's what it was for Republicans. And, uh, and I hope that, it, you know, part of my tweet was that we have two choices. We can go back to sleep and, and do what we've always done, or we can focus on the issues that matter to Texans. And elections are clarifying moments for policymakers of, of all political stripes, for Republicans and Democrats. We are able to put the polls aside, the prognostications, the predictions aside, and look at the results of the elections and get a good, clear glimpse of what the people of Texas, our voters, our constituents, want us to do. Um, looking forward for Republicans, um, my hope is, and, and my strong belief is, that if we focus on those issues that are important to Texans, public education, um, transportation, property tax reform, uh, passing a, a budget that's smart, that's funding the, the um, the programs of state government, the agencies of state government in a way that, that are smart and effective. Um, if we do those things, I believe that in 2020, Republicans can, and Democrats, depending on how the votes line up in the legislature, can go back home and take credit for a good session. My hope, and my strong desire, and what I'm going to be working on is to ensure that the Texas legislature focuses on those big issues that Texans want us to be focusing on. Yeah, and I want to get into more of that. Jim, I'll, I'll ask you this and just to kind of follow up on what they're saying, but just in terms of the changing tide in Texas, do you think that that's happening or do you think that this was a one-time thing? Well, I think we don't know. I think there's a real human factor here. On one hand, clearly all the things that both the representatives have, talking, or have been talking about were at play. The O'Rourke campaign tapped into something latent, but also it articulated for the Democrats relatively nicely what the national environment was. And so I think, you know, I'm sure Alexa's gonna tell you, Alexa's been on this demographic beat and has done great work on this. You know, we've been talking about demographic shifts in Texas, I think, in a kind of simple way for a long time that was always disappointed. Um, the demographics themselves were not gonna drive political change. That was gonna happen in a context. And I thought, I think we're beginning to see some of that here. And clearly, you know, I wrote something not too long ago about how this is the stirring of a more two-party competitive Texas. And I think that is what we're seeing, what the pace of that is, what it looks like, what the terms of that competition are, I think are gonna depend on what elected officials like these two gentlemen and, and many others decide to do, both what they do in the process in the next session, who decides to run for what next time, and I think critically what the issue agenda is. Um, I think we've been seeing an interesting convergence in the last you know, week, 10 days, certainly since the election, and certainly it came out in the denouement of the speaker's race, that public education, you know, exactly the list you, you said, public education, transportation, property tax, how we're gonna fund government, that's a pretty clear articulation from both sides of the aisle, and with a little bit more overlap than I've seen in a while, frankly. 
The question is, will that last? And those are human decisions that will be made by these folks and by the folks that are out there doing the politics. And that's what this is going to depend on in terms of how the, the aftermath shape, shapes up. And we can talk about that. Yeah, uh, Alexa. As Jim mentioned, we saw a big shift for Democrats winning in the suburbs, Republicans still dominating rural areas. You wrote an article recently, I know with several other people from the Tribune, but are, titled, Are Texas Suburbs Slipping Away from Republicans? Are they? I mean, so I think the baseline of this is that Democrats did better this year because the electorate was closer to a presidential year than a midterm year. So across the board, that's going to bring them up. But then on top of that, you see some of these suburban strongholds that have been red for a very long time. But if you look at the margins of victory over time, they've actually been decreasing steadily. Um, you, saw, you saw sort of a, a bigger dip in the Obama years that went back up when you, went, when you elected Governor Greg Abbott. But that's really been exacerbated in the Trump era, and I don't think that's going to change much. I mean, you saw Harris County was sort of this, you know, the biggest battleground in the state, and now I think it's fair to say it's solidly blue. I don't really see that going back into Republicans' control, and that's extended all the way into Fort Bend, which, again, was a huge swing in 2016, and I think the question was, what will happen there? Um, and it was an even bigger swing toward Democrats. I think it's, we're calling it a battleground for now, but it's also hard to see those areas going back to Republican control. The, the suburbs in Central Texas and in the Dallas area are a little bit different. They're much more likely to be white um, but I think that's really interesting to see how the Democrats were able to sort of crack open Central Texas, which has been gerrymandered quite a bit, but they were able to crack open those suburban counties north and south of Travis County, where you really have a lot of people from Austin moving out because they just can't afford to live here. And so the demographic change over time, yes, we have Hispanics becoming of age to vote and becoming more engaged, but you also have the suburbs changing over time in a way that favors Democrats. Yeah, Representative Leach, how does your party recover in the suburbs, in the cities? How do you move forward with this? Well, we focus on good policy. That's, that's what we do. And, and I don't think that my voters want me focused on the 2020 elections right now. My voters want me focused on the legislative session, which convenes in how many days? January 8th. So too, too soon. Yeah, yeah January 8th, <laughs> yeah, in less than lot. two months. Right. Uh, th that's what my voters, and I'm not punting on your question, seriously. I, and In fact, I'm going back home, uh, flying back home after this. I have a speech back in the district tonight to a pretty large Republican club. And, and the speech is going to be focused on what happened last week, uh, what happened in the elections, and how do we prepare for 2020. My point is going to be very simple. My, my statement is going to be very simple that, look, we have to deliver on the promises that we made to our people if... If Republicans and Democrats, but you asked the question about Republicans, if Republicans, if our party under our governor, lieutenant governor, and who's very likely to be our speaker, Representative Dennis Bonin, if we can deliver results for public education, if we can pump more funds into public education, make sure it gets to the right places, if we can invest in transportation, if we can provide substantive real property tax relief and reform, continue to invest in transportation, do the things, take, um, address the health care situation in Texas, um, continue to make sure our economy uh, remains strong. If we do those things, I believe very strongly the 2020 election will take care of itself. So I'm focused on the policy and on achieving results. Representative Johnson, what about Democrats in rural areas? Well, I've had a, a lot of thoughts over a long time about what the future of the Democratic Party and, and rural Texas, you know, and, and not just really, I've thought about this on a national level. It's kind of the same question that's been going on throughout the, the South. Um, how are Democrats going to uh, win back? And I say win back because I, I think most people in this room probably know um, Texas was once a one-party state the other direction. It was once a solidly Democratic state. And, we, and um, rural Texas was once the, the, uh, you know, the, the basis, really, of the Texas um, Democratic Party strength. And it's not that way anymore. Um, it, it's sort of similar to what my colleague here said in reverse. When, it's difficult to campaign against results. It's difficult to campaign. The, the worst thing a political party can find, the worst situation you can find yourself in from a political standpoint is when the other party is actually delivering results and actually performing. When, when you start to get the, a lot of the distracting, like social issues talked about a lot by elected officials, it's usually because 
we're not doing the business of governing very well, so we have to change the subject to something to get people motivated. But when government is working well, when your roads are great and your commute times go down, and when your schools are performing and you're like, hey, I don't have to write a check to St. Stephen's to send my kid to prep school, I can send them to my neighborhood public school and get a great education, people like that. And they tend not to um, vote out the folks who are delivering those results. I think we're gonna have to do the same thing in rural Texas that you're talking about doing in your areas. We're gonna have to show that Democrats have ideas that work well and will bring results for rural Texas. I think that's, there no, the mentality in rural Texas is probably no different than any place else. They wanna know what you're gonna do for them. Um, I think that, that really what both parties going into this next session, I wanna just touch on something you said, um, are saying that's reassuring to me is that that's what this session hopefully is going to be about. Hopefully we have gotten past a, a little bit some of the rhetoricizing on the red meat social stuff to distract from not being able to perform and we will actually be able to deliver for you property tax reform and school finance reform. That's what I'm hoping for. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you all about that in yeah. just a second, but I know you, none of you, well, maybe, don't want to talk about 2020 anymore, but it's fun, so one more question. <laughs> sure, why not? Um, <laughs> We're here to have fun. Representative Leach, do you want President Trump to be the nominee in 2020? <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to what uh, my, my friend just said, and I think it's so true, um, that, that policy is so important, and I, and I agree so strongly with a lot of what we're seeing in terms of policy in Washington. I do, I, I support the Tax Reform Act. I, I like some of his judicial appointments, um, the, the regulations that have been scaled back. Um, I think we've seen and we're seeing results of some of the policies that, that have been put in place in this administration. Having said that, I detest, I detest um, very strongly some of the rhetoric that we're seeing. And um, this, I've never seen it this divided in our country. Um, I'm, I know I'm a younger guy. I'm actually not that young. We're not that young. We're, we're, yeah, no, um, as we look. We're just taking but, care you know, of ourselves. But this division, uh, this division, um, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And it's okay for us to, to, to fight and argue and debate and disagree in Washington or in Austin or in our own communities. But I, I'm very concerned about the future of this country um, in terms of the divisiveness we're seeing from Washington. I know I'm not punting on your question. So he's gonna be maybe? He's gonna be at the top of our ballot. My hope is that between now and then, um, some of the tweets will stop, some of the rhetoric will stop, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. But he, he could use you on Twitter. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but if he's, on, if he's on the ballot, I absolutely will support him. I'll support the policies, absolutely. Representative Johnson, who do you wanna see as the Democratic nominee? Wow, we're gonna have a, <laughs> a very large field, a very large field. I mean, for all the reasons everyone in this room um, who are tuned to politics can, you know, can understand and can think through. I mean, it's, it's from our side, it looks like a tremendous opportunity to restore a tone to that office that we believe uh, most Americans, and I think um, it's borne out by a lot of uh, data, um, want. So. Um, I think from the Democratic standpoint, it's just going to be, un, it's got, it, for my lifetime, I don't think I will have ever seen the number of candidates, quality candidates who are going to line up for this opportunity to, to run against uh, Mr. Trump. So who would I like to see? I'd like to see someone um, who checks several boxes, but some of the most important are, I, I really do believe it needs to be someone who can speak to the growing millennial and young generation. Um, that is our, that's our future as a party. I think we need to double down on that investment. Doesn't mean we necessarily need to nominate one of them. There will be some that step forward. I mean, I know a couple um, personally who are considering jumping in whose names have been put on um, a, a, you know, most people's list. Uh, Jason Would Kander, like uh, Pete, Pete oh. Buttigieg, the <laughs> mayor of, uh, of um, South Bend, Indiana. Um, Jason Kander, um, there's, a, there's some 30-somethings who are seriously uh, looking at that, but the, 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 the point is, is I think it needs to be someone who can excite that generation. We, we cannot have any lag in enthusiasm going into to 2020. And of course, there's a very obvious person hanging out there now that was not a name that anyone would have necessarily said a year ago, but um, um, Congressman O'Rourke is a, is a real potential um, 
draw to that demographic, and, uh, and either slot on a ticket could be very, very appealing. So someone like him and any number of uh, sitting U.S. senators or former or current governors would be uh, fine choices. And as a member of the DNC, I'm not going to necessarily say a name of someone that I prefer over the others. I'm going to look at all of them, but, and I'll be you know, casting my vote um, in that process for who I think will be the best person. But right now, I think it looks very good for us. We have a lot of good choices. Jen, that's a good segue to you, because you recently wrote that uh, Beto should run for Senate in 2020. He could win. Do you think he should run for Senate as opposed to Well, president? I mean, I wrote that in a way not, I mean, certainly not even in a way. I wrote that not as a partisan, but as kind of looking at the, at the discussion of better work being in the in the presidential field versus being in the Senate field. And and to my mind, if he's gonna run again, I lose at least one person in this room who vociferously disagreed with this on Facebook. So we'll wait for the, the Q and A, John. But uh, <laughs> but um, look, I mean I and this is not in the big frame that you're talking about, but to my mind what really motivated my thinking about that was your first question is what is this what does this mean for the future of Texas? And it seems to me that one of the things that's been really distinctive about Texas history is how rarely we've had a truly competitive political system in the state. We had a long period for historical reasons of democratic rule with a lot of political conflict contained in the Democratic Party. We've had a shorter, not quite as decisive, but still pretty clear period of one party dominance by the Republican Party. I think if Beto O'Rourke was to run again, challenge John Cornyn in 2020, whether Cornyn decided to stay in the race or get out, it would further a more competitive party system. And I think that, I mean, I sort of reject and don't believe in the fantasy, I think it's a fantasy that Texas is ever gonna turn blue. I think it's not in the state's DNA anymore. I think it's not in the fundamentals. I think it's not what we're looking at. I think the future of Texas is much more likely to look, and this is a bad time to say this, akin to Florida than to California. Mm -hmm. But in terms of just party competition and the dynamic, I think that's I much more likely. And I frankly think as a, as a person who, you know, asserts a pretty strong degree of nonpartisanship in the way I look at these things, I think it's good for the state. Alex, I'll let you weigh in on that, but just, you know, with what they're saying, we've kind of talked about some of the red areas getting redder, blue getting bluer, um, or this mix of everything involved, but they've hinted at this, but what do you think it means for Texas governing for this next legislative session, but beyond that too. I mean, I, I think one of the the takeaways from the election was that this whole idea of Texas isn't a red state, Texas isn't a blue state, it's a non-voting state. It's a faulty argument to begin with because you obviously are what you vote. Um, but I think it shows that Texas can change, but I think what's important is timing. And we're going into a legislative session, it's the last one right before the next round of redistricting. And so looking ahead about if you're going to have six months to make this a better state for people to live in and use that to then run in 2020, what can the parties do to convince those voters to stay with them in 2020? Because that's really the election that counts for future governing in the state. You know, that's the long-term election that counts when you think about coming back in 2021 and redrawing those districts. And so I don't, I don't, I mean, I think everyone's sort of kumbaya at the moment in the house and everyone's really happy about having a new leader um, that they, you know, lots of people are getting behind, but I, it's hard for me to believe that we live in a world in which the social issues that dominated last legislative session are going away. Um, maybe they won't suck the legislative air out of the room again, but it's hard to believe that those are going away and that it won't just be a divisive legislative session in the way we saw last time. Um, Jim, with Governor Abbott did so much better than a lot of the other statewide candidates, um, aside from Senator Cruz, put him aside, but why do you think that is? What do you think that spells, again, just for governing here in Texas? Well, I think it's, it's another one of those questions that has multiple answers. One, you know, Governor Abbott um, has done a good job of, to my mind, occupying the institutional space of being governor in a way that enables him to benefit both from his real strong support among Republican partisans, extremely popular among Republican partisans, and though there's a lot of partisan structure in his you know, job approval numbers, he's not, you know, you compare his Democratic numbers to Senator Cruz's numbers, there's a real difference. I mean, he's not acceptable is too strong a word, but, you know, Democrats don't go out and want to, you know, 
frankly, you know, burn him in effigy the way they kind of want to Ted Cruz, to be, just to be straight right. about it. I mean, he's, you know, and, and I think part of that is the way that he has governed. I mean, the governor's office enables you to be the figurehead in Texas. It gives you enormous symbolic political advantages, and the governor has been very good at taking advantage of that, and he's done a good job in the right moments. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, he, you know, he was very present in the natural disasters and the calamities that we've had in the state. I think his reviews, I mean, it's hard even for a partisan to go, oh, look at that guy, you know, being there on the ground in the flooding, what a jerk. I mean, it's just not gonna happen. And he's been very good at that, I think. What you just identified about Governor Abbott is what I fear would be Congressman O'Rourke's problem in a 2020 race against John Cornyn, though. Yeah. I feel like John Cornyn is a much more difficult target to articulate a, a clear, clash and, and a dichotomy between candidates that I think is so crucial when you're trying to unseat a U.S. senator. And I think just as a quick aside, that is the biggest structural barrier to running against Corn is that he is not easily vilifiable the way Ted Cruz is. And, that, and that's, that's, that's a hard, that's already a hard mountain to climb to unseat yeah. a senator to begin with, but one who's not really distinguished themselves for being particularly bad yeah. Um, is makes that mountain even more that income. No, I, I think I think that's a factor. I think you know we could. Yeah, I mean, one thing I would say, uh, just a slight response, which yeah. is that you know, but the the problem is he will have Donald Trump at the top of the ticket, and between now and then he'll have to make some decisions in the Senate about the degree to which he is close to or distances himself from from the president, and that's right. that's tricky. I mean, as we've seen, I think. But it, what I do think was interesting about election night is that if you looked at the margins in a place like Williamson County, you had O'Rourke win the district, Abbott held on to it pretty easily, but then you had Ken Paxton, the attorney general, lose it. And so it was, it was pretty fascinating to see that people were actually going down the ballot and making informed decisions about who they were choosing in each race, and I don't know that we've seen that to that extent in previous elections. I think we're gonna have to look, there's, gonna, there's some data, I mean, we haven't had a chance to crunch a lot of this right. data yet. There's some ballot roll-off to, to assess there too, and I, you know, I've eyeballed it. By roll-off, I mean people that just quit voting. There's a room that's gonna know what roll-off is, but. Sure. Um, I suspect some of that is in there, and I also suspect that at least based on the polling going in, independents who we usually don't pay a ton of attention to because they're sort of non-attentive and true independents are not numerous enough in a, in a lopsided election to really worry about. Independents split in interesting ways that we usually don't pay attention to, I, I suspect. Kind of brings up another point, um, and maybe it's too early to get into this, but I mean, this was the last time around for straight ticket I was thinking this voting. So what do you think that spells then for the future if people are being more informed and going through and actually picking them? Or how much do you think that was a factor this time around? Uh, Representative Johnson, you want to start that? I, you don't get a policy like that by accident. So someone thought about this and someone probably didn't think of this in the absence of any data of some sort or information of some sort. Probably wasn't just a gut instinct because it was too structural of a change that was potentially too um, determinative of too many important outcomes for it not to have been thought through. And so what I have to assume is that this was what the calculus was. Statewide, it's going to hurt Republicans somewhat to lose the straight ticket advantage. But the Republicans, I think, at the time when they thought of this idea, felt like their cushion was sufficient to be able to give up a couple of points statewide, and that would be okay. I think what they had in mind was what it would do in counties like mine. They were thinking D Dallas and Harris and counties like that, where that ballot drop off that you might get um, from the loss of the straight ticket could actually unseat several Democrats who are running countywide. And I can tell you, I didn't realize how, county judge to me, because I'm a, a creature of government and love government, is such an important job to me, it's such a big deal. I mean, we have legislators who leave on purpose to go and become county commissioners and county judges. But on a six-page ballot in Dallas County, when you see where county judge is, it blows your mind. You realize how it, it is buried on page five of six after like all of your federals, all of your states, and then, your count, then all your state district judges, and then all your county actual court at law judges. You get that county judge race way down there. Be, it, will, it will be difficult for um, Democrats who are accustomed to enjoying that straight ticket balance in counties like Dallas to um, get elected and, and 
close contests um, going forward in 2020. So I think that's what the calculation was. They were gonna, the Republicans were gonna give up a little bit of the statewide advantage, but they might start picking off local Democrats in key counties uh, like Dallas and Harris because of the loss of the straight ticket. Representative Leach, I'll let you respond. I mean, what's the thinking behind this for Republicans? Well, I, I, I was a bit surprised on the, the floor of the Texas House that night when we voted on that bill. I think it was House Bill 25 by Representative Simmons, who unfortunately, I mean, one of my dearest friends in the world, he unfortunately lost his election last week. Um, it, it was interesting on the floor that night how partisan it was. Republicans generally supported it. I'm not sure there was a single Democrat who voted for the bill. Don't, don't quote me on that. I could be wrong by a few votes. But... Um, I, what we want, the objective is to have a more informed voter and um, to, uh, to ensure that, and for those of you that don't know, you can still straight ticket vote, but you have to go through, the, we did away with one punch voting, so you can't go in and pick Republican or Democrat, you, you have to go through each race, as, as Eric just said. I think that's a good thing for both parties. It's going to create some challenges for us um, in, in our campaigns, right, because now we have to go actually kind of not retrain our voters, right? but communicate to our voters how important it is to go down ballot to that county judge race. Um, and also just a logistical issue we're gonna face, wait times at polls. Oh, yeah. um, we're gonna have to, to look into that this session. How do we address wait times at polls? Because even this year with turnout as high as it was, even with one punch voting, wait times were, were through the roof. That's a, that's a challenge. We do not want uh, to make it harder for people to, to go to the polls, see a lion and say, well, I'm not gonna go vote. We want people to be informed, and we want them to feel like they could come vote quickly, relatively quickly. So, um, Getting back on, just in terms of governing, Representative Leach, I mean, you mentioned somebody who lost, but your race was very close. How do you think that changes your stance on governing and seeing some of, you know, with the Freedom Caucus, with some of the Tea Party-aligned members? You know, my, all I can do is focus on, on Jeff Leach. I can't worry about other members, uh, what they're doing, what they're saying, and that includes our president, um, our senator, our governor. Uh, my job is to vigorously advocate for the 190,000 people I represent in Collin County. Since the end of last session, and I think for a lot of us, Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals, last session was very frustrating. It was a, it was a mess of a session for a number of reasons. And so when we went back home, my focus was to go on a listening tour of my district, to go and spend time with my constituents, knocking on thousands of doors, meeting with educators. I'm literally about to wrap up an education tour of my district, visiting every single public school, nearly 50 public schools in my district, meeting with law enforcement parents. And, um, and, and what I'm hearing is, like I said earlier, the issues that are important to my voters are very clear. And uh, I, I am not going to, um, at, I don't want to assume that I got caught up in the blue wave, the Beto wave, if you will, but I do not believe that my, my district, District 67, is as close as this recent election um, showed. So what I've got to go do is to go win the trust of voters who may not have voted for me this time but may have in past elections. And the way I'm going to do that is to achieve results this legislative session. I think we're going to do that. You've kind of mentioned this too, but do you see a lot of divisive issues coming forth this time around like we saw last session? Well, I mean, look, the, the legislature by its very nature is... <laughs> or at least like, maybe taking precedent. Yeah, right. I mean, it's like watching, around. you know, hot dogs get made. You enjoy the end product, but you don't really want to watch the process, right? Um, and so <laughs> I, I think what I'm hearing now in my conversations with colleagues on both sides of the aisle is people are ready to get back to work. Uh, we all have to deliver for our districts. I don't care if it's District 100 or District 67, blue or red. We've got to deliver. And I think you see a sense of collegiality. I'm very glad. Uh, I know you were running, running for speaker. I thought we were going to meet today to talk about my support for Eric Johnson oh. for speaker. Just a couple uh, days late, but, uh, Leach. A couple no, days no, this late. is a good guy right here. We agree on a lot more than we disagree on. Um, and I've been in his district. He's been in mine. We, we're working together on some things. And, um, and so I believe... I'm glad the speaker's race, it's not behind us. There's still, still some things that could happen before January, but I believe strongly that Dennis Bonin is gonna be our speaker. He's gonna do a great job. He's got bipartisan support. We're ready to get to work. And uh, the divisive issues, sure, there will be some, but I don't think they're gonna be the focus. I really don't. You guys have all helped segue into other things. Uh, Representative Johnson, you ran for speaker I and did. pulled your name out when it looked like Representative Bonin had the votes to do this. Um, what do you think this means for Democrats? Because you were a big advocate for how much say they could have in this, especially with the pickups. What do I think um, the, the possible election of Dennis Bonin as speaker means for Democrats? Yes. Or I just want to make sure I'm clear. Yeah, with Bonin, if he is 
as it looks like, will be speaker. What do you think that means for Democrats in the House? Well, I think unless the Democrats were going to, um, to elect a, a, or be able to form a coalition with the Republicans to elect a Democrat, and that would have been me in this case because I was the only Democrat who ran, I think we were going to be in this situation one way or the other. Like we, it, it, I was either going to be the speaker or we were going to be working with a Republican speaker. Um, so what this is going to now boil down to is all of us figuring out, and, we're, and it's going to be a process for everyone, Democrat and Republican, uh, figuring out what our new speaker, if that is going to be Representative Bonnet, it appears that it's going to be, um, what his, A, agenda is going to be. He's already given us an indication that school finances is, is on it, but um, that's, that's one topic. We'll see what the other topics are. We, we don't know yet. Um, and then we'll also have to see what his governing style is going to be. Um, I think it's an interesting speaker politics and the whole speaker <laughs> dynamic. For those of us who, who really love the institution and love history, um, the Texas House of Representatives is just a fascinating institution, and that office is a fascinating office. And I'm not comparing it to the presidency in any other way than, than, than what I'm about to say, and that is it's the kind of job, because we've instilled so much power in it in Texas, where it really does reveal what kind of person you, you, you've got once you get that gavel, because the, the power is just enormous. And so um, I'm hoping, and, and, and I think that those of us who have supported Dennis are hoping that, that um, he rises to this occasion and is a leader that Texas needs right now to focus on, like we've been talking about, the things that I know the voters want us to be focused on. But it remains to be seen. It's, it's something that that office gives everyone who holds it an opportunity to rise to it or to crumble underneath the weight of that responsibility. And you know, throughout history, if you've studied our history, we've had speakers who've gone both directions. People who've gotten that gavel, and that gavel's proven too heavy for them. And it's, all, and it's been a him every time up to this point. Um, hopefully someday soon it'll be a she. But up to now, it's been a him. Um, that gavel is, is People have crushed under themselves underneath the weight, and some people have risen to the occasion and, and, and really done very well. And I'm hopeful that Dennis does very well. I'm always very careful with what I say on air or anywhere, but I think all of us would probably say that Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, Dennis Bonin um, are very strong-willed and <laughs> not afraid to speak their mind. I mean, how do you see, Jim, this dynamic playing out between the two of them? Well, honestly, as I was sitting here being a panelist instead of a moderator, I was just thinking about a way that, and you've, you've helped me enormously, I could just ask these guys. My sense of this, and I've spent a lot of time just because of where I've been in the last week with, I've been around a lot of members and a lot of people that are obsessed with what has happened at a couple of professional conferences. I would wonder, I mean, I, I think one of the impressions out there that's underlying your, your question, and I'll say it on air, I guess, is that one of the things that Dennis Bonin brought to the table that helped them helped him build a coalition across different factions in the Republican Party, across party lines, is that he was seen as an able and willing defender of the House as a body against, you know, vis-a-vis -vis in, the, in the perpetual competition and contention with the Senate. Would I, would I be correct in that? I, yeah, I, I get your point, and I agree. I agree. I, I think that, um, look, the Senate and the House have to work together. One of the problems last session was we, we had a very dysfunctional relationship. I don't want to place all the blame on, on the Speaker or the Lieutenant Governor or the Governor. We, we bear some responsibility in that as well. I believe that Representative Bonin and Lieutenant Governor Patrick are going to work well together. Look at the statement they put out yesterday. And, uh, and again, if we focus on the big priorities, for instance, you cannot provide property tax relief without addressing school finance. That's right. And you cannot address school finance without talking about property taxes. And last session, we just did this, all session. Our chamber had a very different idea than what the Senate had. But now we're seeing senators and representatives and the Senate governor and the new speaker talk and communicate. That's a good thing for Republicans and Democrats and for the people we're elected to serve. So I think it's going to work out well. Well, let's all let you weigh in on this, too, just in terms of, you know, the divide that we saw last time around versus the people that we all think are going to be, um, well, Bonin, we know Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, but just the, the dynamics between the two of them. Yeah, I mean, I think... Maybe even the three of them with Abbott. Sure. Well, I think Bonin, in a lot of ways, checked off the boxes for a majority of 
you know, at least the folks that have signed on in his support. There were people who were happy with Joe Strauss. He was in his leadership team, and so he had that going for them with them. There were people who wanted someone who was a bit more conservative than Joe Strauss, and I think it's fair to say that Dennis Bonin is to the right of him. Um, and then there were people who wanted for someone to stand up for the House. Uh, that, that's not to say that Joe Strauss didn't, because I think that was clear at the end of the last session that he did. But in a lot of ways, he checked off those boxes. What I think is sort of unclear at this point is how much of the Dennis Bonin that was will remain once he's speaker, um, if he's speaker, um, and going up against Dan Patrick. I mean, I think from, as a journalist, you know, we'd love to see people fighting because it makes for great copy. <laughs> glad but, you admit that. I'm glad you admit Now I, mean, I know that's true. But when you think about, when you think about the, the session as the six month period in which folks at the Capitol have an opportunity to make Texas a better place for people like the ones in this audience, um, you know, I, I think it's sort of, pretty, it's too soon to say that it'll be sort of happy-go-lucky once things get moving. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it was just awesome to see how many people came out and how many people were engaged this last time around with voter turnout and everybody coming to the poll. So hopefully that continues. Um, with that, I think it's probably, I don't know what time it is, but about time. We've got questions from 42. the audience. Perfect. Uh, you right there. Thank you. Um, as someone who teaches ab about Texas government and U.S. government, I have a sort of a political science-y type question going back to your uh, discussions of the electoral issues. Um, it, it appeared that we were seeing a suburban realignment both here in Texas and in the U.S. House of Representatives where the suburbs were shifting towards the, uh, towards the Democrats in this election. Is that something that, uh, and I guess particularly for Jim, but for anyone else who wants to comment, is that something that you think is a permanent change that we're seeing, or is it a temporary reaction against Trump and the, and what, and his attitude towards women and his rhetoric and so forth? Um, so yeah, it, permanent, temporary, some combination, somewhere in between. What do you think? Well, I mean, I, I think, couple things. One, in the, in, well, overall, we're still kind of looking at stuff. Um, but I think, you know, but I think that it's a trend line. I think Alexa is exactly right. I mean, th nobody should be surprised that if we saw a big surge in turnout and particularly, and the, you know, and don't forget, the surge in turnout was in both parties. Yep. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but that it was, you know, it was obviously in, at the top of the ticket, it was disproportionately democratic. That that was going to be an in, that was going to definitely amplify these trend lines that have already been there. I don't, you know, I think that trend line continues. I think it probably recedes a little bit. I think that part of what was going on here is two things. One, there's regional variations. I think in the same way that we tend to make to overgeneralize about ethnic groups, particularly Latinos, we can overgeneralize about the suburbs too. Not all suburbs are the same. I mean, they reflect some of the urban, the character of the urban, of the urban areas that they're satellites of. I think we need to look more carefully at that. And then second, I think redistricting, we're, talk, we're talking a lot prospectively about the stakes of redistricting moving forward, which is important. But I think we should pause a moment and look at these suburban results in some of these districts and see how some of the areas where Republicans had difficulties, where, you know, and I was having an exchange with Michael Lee, who I'm sure is much more you know, most, most of you know is at the Brennan Center now, but was in Texas for a long time on Twitter, to mm -hmm. tie it all together, mm -hmm. about how some of those districts, what you're seeing is a very ambitious, and I don't mean that in a judgmental way, but there was a very ambitious redistricting in 2011 that maximized Republican representation in districts. And I think we should not be surprised that those, some of those districts, that redistricting map, they're just getting exhausted. I mean, you look at a place like Plano, where you've had 10%, you had 10% population increase in Plano between 2010 and 2017. In a lot of these areas, particularly these areas where, where there were in the two seats where the Congress, uh, the, Congress uh, the party in Congress change, Col uh, Culbertson and Sessions, those are really rapid growth areas. It's inevitable that those maps are gonna become kind of exhausted and the partisan assumptions are gonna shift that probably amplifies our expectation on the side of, well, look, everything's changed. Exit polls show you know, kind of a 50-50 split in a lot of those areas. That's a movement 
you know, in the, at the governor's level of about six, seven points. That's big. It's enough to change some things at the district level, but I wouldn't begin to pronounce all suburbs democratic by a long shot. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I saw throughout the campaign in Collin County, and I represent Plano, uh, is in our own neighborhood, in Becky and I's own neighborhood, one of the strongest Republican precincts in the entire county, you could drive the streets. In fact, our next door neighbor had three yard signs in her yard. Greg Abbott, Jeff Leach, and Beto O'Rourke. I so, hope you have a picture of that. So for and <laughs> so so that I asked my I said what does this what does this mean? I'm not sure we know actually what that means. Um, I, I, something tells me that that voter went in and maybe last minute did a straight ticket Democrat tick, ticket just because their the numbers would bear out that that person did actually not cross pollinate their ticket um, because it was a down ballot influence all the way down. And number two, uh, we we saw a poll came out this week um, that with a, sh a shocking number that surprised me pleasantly that, well, I don't know the exact number, 65% maybe of people who've moved here from California voted for Cruz over Beto? It's a CNN exit poll, I'm skeptical. Okay, for well, the yeah, if it's from CNN, fake news. Um, so, well, I but, didn't say that. No, but, <laughs> but, but you know, so, 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 so political scientists, pollsters, consultants need to look at all of these numbers and tell us what does this mean for the future of Texas. I don't think it's a blue wave. I don't think it's a red tsunami. I think it's it is what it is, and we're going to be left to figure it out. The one thing I'll add, and I'll keep it short, is I agree with what Jim said, that some of this is going to recede. I don't think Republicans have lost all of the suburbs. But I do think that when you think about redistricting and drawing maps that are supposed to last 10 years, in a state like Texas, the biggest drop in population is going to be among white people, and those are more likely to be Republican voters. And where you're gonna see that the most is in the suburbs, where you're going to see that change and that drop the most is going to be in places like Dallas County and its surrounding areas. And so, you know, you, you have a place like Dallas County where Republicans ran out of white voters, and so they cut their margins really thin, and that's part of why you saw a lot of those districts flip to blue this time around, and I think, you know, I've talked to enough sort of folks who are crunching the numbers to know that the next round of redistricting is going to be pretty tough for Republicans to draw as many safe districts if they are depending solely on white voters. I had a two-parter. So Jim, is your purple shirt and your purple socks indicative of the way things are going in Texas? Yeah, good. No, I'm, you know, I, I go for, I strive for message consistency. <laughs> Um, Dan Patrick had a big effect on the way things happened in the last session, and you touched upon him and so forth, and the Senate a little bit. Um, I wanted to know, in light of all of the right-wing, social, crazy conservative stuff that happened in the, let, just to put it mildly, to, uh, in the last session, do you foresee that that's going to come up again in the fashion that it did last time? Representative Leach, I'll let you well, take that. Oh. <laughs> um, I let me let me put it. You talk about the bathroom bill. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well. That's a, I, I mean, look. You you can call him, and with all, all due respect, um, you know, the, the the abortion issue, the 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 life issue, choice. What that that's for for a lot of Texans, polling would say that's actually not a crazy right wing issue. There's a lot of people who care very deeply about it from both sides. There are Democrats in the Texas legislature that are very pro-life um, and, and, and that, that have voted for the pro-life bills. With respect to the bathroom bill, that was really the lightning rod last session. Let me just say this very, very quickly. Um, I mentioned earlier that I've visited with thousands of constituents over the past 18 months. Law enforcement, educators, parents, students themselves, um, constituents. And do you know how many people have told me that the bathroom bill is a big priority for them next session? Zero. Right. Um, it will probably be filed. I assume that it might come up, but it's, it's, it, I don't think it should be a priority for the Texas legislature this session. I mean, that group of folks that you're talking about were also the ones who in the last legislative session came out and said, we don't, this isn't a priority for us. Well, but with, with respect, last legislative session, the summer before we went into session, that was when uh, President, then President Obama issued that directive. I mean, it was kind of a, right during the Republican convention in Dallas, and so it, it was a big issue for a lot of our primary voters. I sense that we're, we're focusing more on property tax reform now and school finance and on those, those bigger issues that we should focus on. I want to split the difference between the two positions that, well, implied there anyway, which is that one of the things we saw and why 
there's something that, you know, embedded in that question is an interesting point, which is that we asked about the saliency of regulating access to bathrooms in as neutral a way as we could, you know, going into this, you know, well before it really became the issue that it became, and, and found what you found, which was that there was not a lot of interest in the issue. Not very many people thought it was important. But as it became, and it was in the wake of the Obama administration actions, but as some elements of the leadership, I mean, let me just say what it was, as the lieutenant governor began to talk about it a lot, it increased in salience among, among partisans. And so that's where I think leadership and the question of what, how you're gonna define the agenda and what people are talking about in leadership positions really matters. I mean, you know, we, you guys are elected to listen to the voters, but we also know that leadership figures, what they say, also shapes priorities. And so a big factor is gonna be, you know, when, what people choose to emphasize. Thank you for your question. Yeah, I'm just interested in uh, the likelihood of maybe having some redistricting reform next in this upcoming session, like Arizona, like California, and some other states have moved toward. Ask the, the vice chair of Johnson, we'll get on about yeah. how, I think I heard you about five times on the floor last yeah. session. This committee's never even met. So I'll let everybody know on the inside joke. I was the vice chair of the redistricting committee last session. It did not meet one time. I repeatedly asked for the committee to meet. It had bills that were referred to it, including some that I had written, um, and several that dealt with this issue, that dealt with alternatives to uh, legislative redistricting. And uh, a, a meeting of the committee never occurred. Even once we had a lawsuit um, decided by a panel of federal judges that actually uh, gave us an opportunity to go in and, and do something, or at least to talk about the implications of the lawsuit we didn't, we didn't meet. So the inside joke is that basically I was this vice chair of this a very important committee that had very important work to do um, and couldn't get it to meet. And uh, I, was, uh, I started a countdown clock you know, on, the, on Twitter about how, long, how many days had gone on where this committee hadn't, hadn't met. And I tried to make an issue of the fact that you know, the way our legislative committees work is that you, know, you get a chair of a committee, you get a committee staff, you get an office. So this committee was fully staffed like every other committee of the legislature. Taxpayer money was going to paying a, a committee staff It had office space in the Capitol and did not meet one time. So I made a big issue of that and it never went anywhere. But um, I have already pre-filed a, a bill dealing with one aspect. There's, there are several aspects of, of redistricting and, and that we need to talk about. And one of them uh, that I have filed a bill on deals with where we count uh, incarcerated folks for the purposes of, of the census, for the purposes of drawing mm -hmm. legislative districts. Um, just, just to give everybody a quick primer on what that's about. I mean, we have about enough incarcerated individuals in Texas to constitute an entire legislative district of their own. We have about 190,000 incarcerated folks. That's a problem. But, but they're incarcerated in places that are not where they're from, and they, interestingly enough, count where they're incarcerated. So they're artificially boosting up the population of the places where they're located, which are primarily uh, West Texas and places like that. And they're undercounting in districts like mine, frankly, um, where a lot of the folks who are incarcerated in our state are from. So I have a piece of legislation that would, that would deal with that. But I'm hopeful, but not necessarily confident, that we will um, have a different result this session, but you know, I'm going to continue to push and, and, and see if we can deal with that and the bills that will inevitably be filed, I'm sure there are already some, that would actually look at forming a, a, a nonpartisan um, commission to look at um, redistricting that way. And, and there's some other different takes on that concept, but um, we'll see. We'll see if we talk about it. At a minimum, the committee probably has to start meeting during the interim between the conclusion of this upcoming session and the next one to start dealing with the redistricting of the next session. So whoever is put on this committee is not going to be able to get a pass on not dealing with this issue at all, because I think they're going to have to start the process of holding hearings and dealing with redistricting even um, during the interim between this session and the next. I believe Representative Donna Howard has already filed a redistricting Probably so. commission, maybe some others too. I actually completely agree with what he just said. 
Absolutely. I will say the redistricting committee might have to meet because HD90 needs to be redrawn as part of the litigation that wrapped up earlier this year. And that, that bill needs to be filed within the first 45 days of session. So if it goes through the redistricting commission, right. you'd at least have one committee meeting. Yeah, if I'm on it. <laughs> I may have talked my way out of the vice chairmanship of it. Yeah. <laughs> he did. He did. Yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's going to free up your Twitter. It is. It is. It is. It is. <laughs> I didn't plan on speaking, but you both made reference on numerous occasions to the suburbs and to property tax reform as well as to school finance reform. I'm one of those council members that live in the suburbs, live in Pflugerville, so we're not some extreme liberal institution, but it's definitely had significant changes since we did in our last census as well regarding that aspect. I just came from a form, text municipal league form, TML form across the state, and we're speaking specifically about how we dread when you guys go ahead and you go down to the Capitol and you have those six months regarding issues and concerns of what's going to come out of that. In particular, what was interesting to find was just like what was great to see which amongst both of you is that you're seeing some uniformity regarding some pragmatic issues that you need to address. Everyone, liberal, conservative, black, white, Hispanic, whatever you thought about, we all agreed that local control is local control. And so when we hear issues regarding property tax, you know, issues and concerns, we have no qualms with them actually going ahead and being addressed, but there's also issues regarding, just like you said, um, Representative, about good roads, good schools, and how do you address those issues? So if you're, uh, my question to both of you is this, is that if you're speaking about true property tax reform in the state of Texas, are you accompanying that with money that will go back to local municipalities to help pay for roads, to help pay for these school districts, so it doesn't just fall back into burden on us who have to explain to our citizens, yeah, the reason why your property taxes are the way it is is because we're not getting funding or support at the Capitol. The answer, the, the, the very short answer is property te Texans of all political stripes from all parts of the state are crying out for property tax relief. When my property taxes are going up eight, nine percent per year, but my income's only going up one to two percent per year, if that, or I may be on a fixed income, that's a problem that the cities, the school districts, and the legislators should do this on, collaborate on, because we have to deliver property tax relief and reform. Um, and there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to work together on that. I don't think it's going to be a 2.5 percent cap. I would vote for that. I would accept that. I don't think it's going to be that, but I do think it should be lower than what it is now. And so, I also want you to be able to hire police and fire and build roads and repair pipelines and do all the things you need to do as a city. Let's work together on it instead of fighting against each other. Long discussion we could have about this. I'm on Ways and Means and I have a background in municipal finance. So I could go into this for a long, long time. I'll just suffice it to say right now, I oppose revenue caps. I don't like the concept because I, I understand the flexibility that local governments need to be able to address the unique needs of their citizens on a whole range of issues. I also understand that the largest part of your property tax bill is your school right. um, property tax portion. And then of course, and you said this correctly, although you will start to get some, you'll start to get some variance amongst members once I get to the second part of this, we agree that school finance is, is a critical port, part of and a critical portion of any real property tax reform because it's such a significant part of what we pay property taxes for. Um, the issue, though, is we, we have to confront the issue head on at some point. And everyone's going to have to jump into one camp or another on this. It's the second part of the discussion that, that people don't want to necessarily tackle right now. And even our public school uh, finance commission hasn't really tackled, which is do we want to put more money into the system or not? People talk about the relative share of public education that the state's paying versus the locals are paying, because we kind of all know that we, where that, where that needle has been headed for a while and that it's going in the wrong direction from the perspective of, you know, where the, you know, where the dividing lines between the, the local portion and the state portion. But the question really that we're going to have to get to is, are you, a, are you a revenue increase supporter or are you not? In other words, do you want to put more money into public education than we're putting in, no matter how we divide up um, who's paying for it? Because it, in, in the end, and here's the sort of the, I'm going to give you the punchline. In the end, it all comes from the people because that's how we pay for government. Whether you call it a, a local property tax or you call it a sales tax, whatever, it, we ultimately all pay it, but they all have different policy implications. So 
we're going to have to make a decision about whether or not we want to put more money into the system after we've made the decision and, about and what, I'll, where, I'll say how this. we spend it. I'm one of the most conservative, proudly, one of the most conservative members in the Texas House. I think based on any ranking, I think it was like 10th, okay, at 150. Proud of that. And I will say right here, right now, publicly, what I've said before is that we absolutely should put more money into public education. No question about it. And, um, and my education tour to nearly 50 public schools has reinforced that. We also have to take care of our retired teachers and take care of health care. And I, I don't know if the camps are going to be as uh, maybe monumentally or clearly divided as they were last session. I think there's generally a, and the governor has said so publicly as well. Now, whether we can get it done in a legislative session is another question. But I think there is a desire on the side, our side of the aisle to do just that. And if we do so, you'll see your property taxes reformed. This will be our last question. Uh, Jim, I won't ask the question I was going to ask because uh, Chair Johnson actually made my argument to you on Facebook. But what I did want to ask you all about is um, do you think if the Republicans statewide run what I'll call more of the traditional or more temperate Republican candidates like Governor Abbott, like Trump Comptroller Hager, like George P. Bush, as opposed to the ones that are a little bit more stridently, confrontationally conservative, like Attorney General Paxton, like Lieutenant Governor Patrick, is that going to help the blue waves receding in the suburbs and what I'll call uh, formerly or historically upscale Republican enclaves in the cities? You know, I think that's the conventional wisdom, John, and I'm not, th my honest opinion is I'm not sure, because I think we still haven't figured out what the sorting actually looked like in this last election. I mean, I think there's some intuitive sense to that, but, you know, as I kind of implied in my, you know, response about why Gover Governor Abbott ran better, there's a lot of reasons that there, I, that I don't think we quite have sorted out for the differential turnout and the differential votes for at those different levels of office. Ideology is one of them, but there are some others as well. I would say this. I'm, I'm going to answer this question in a very different way. I would say if I were, I'm going to take your question and pretend like I was actually a consultant to Republicans trying to interpret what this election means and what we need to do if we want to continue to be competitive and we want to continue our dominance of the state. This is what my hunch is, is what actually is going on. And again, I don't have the, the data yet crunched um, to do it. If, certainly, if you don't have it, I don't. But here's what I really think um, I would advise. I'd say, look, I think that the takeaway from this election is this. There is a distinction between the Texas electorate and the Texas voting age population. Those are two different things. I think the Texas electorate skews Republican. The electorate today, frozen today, skews Republican. I think the Texas population voting age skews Democratic. And as people are moved from the category of being a member of the population but not part of the electorate into the electorate, you will continue to see a slow or maybe not so slow march towards more election results like what we saw on Tuesday. Whether you like it or not, whether you think it's a good thing or not, I think that's the actual political science answer is election nights like Tuesday are going to become more common than less. If I'm a Republican consultant, then I have to huddle my people and say, guys, gals, here's what we've got to consider. We've got to start considering general election consequences of our policies. We, can't, we can no longer just be obsessed with primary ramifications of our policies. Things like bathroom bills and things like that are the old way of thinking when all we had to care about was a Republican primary. But now that general elections are actually relevant, those kind of policies have, we have to not only not put them out there, we have to try to get people to forget we ever did them. And we need to move towards issues that work for us in the general election. And I would spend all of my time as a Republican crafting electoral strategies around winning general elections because they're about to become more relevant for you sure. and Matt Shaheen sure. and all the guys up in Collin County that we're talking about. I believe that this is actually becoming the new normal, what we saw on Tuesday. I believe that. Yep, I don't disagree. Well, writing him a check for his Republican. <laughs> it, it, it will become the new normal if, if Republicans refuse 
to, for instance, if I refuse to communicate with millennials right now because they're voting overwhelmingly Democrat, or if I refuse to reach out to and listen to suburban women, if I refuse to, I mean, the, the Hispanic population in Texas, uh, many polls suggest, is, should be a natural base for the Republican Party. And uh, we've kind of stiff-armed them with the way we communicate. And, and, and I, we've got to do a better job of communicating and listening and delivering results. Texas is a great place to live. We are doing really well. We don't have a whole lot to be ashamed of in terms of our results. We've done a pretty poor job of communicating that to the people. And, and we've got to do better. I think we'll end on that great conversation. Give some applause to it's all of the yeah. panelists. Hey, great to see you. Thank you so much.